As Pastor Tyler said, we are beginning a new sermon series today that's going to take us through the rest of the summer up until Labor Day. It's entitled Mission. Now, the reading that we had from Matthew's Gospel is something that probably a lot of us have heard. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, we see that here is the risen Jesus, crucified out of the grave, giving instructions to his disciples. And it's these instructions that he gives about the mission of God. God's redemptive and restorative work in the world that he is handing off to his followers that he has trained for three years. Now, a lot of us probably say, yes, this is what we know as the Great Commission. These words that Jesus calls and charges to his disciples to participate and to be a partner in what Jesus is doing in the world. And one of the things that has always just fascinated me is that those first disciples right on through the rest of us to today is that God chooses to partner with us. God wants us to be the vehicles and the instruments and the means by which faith, saving faith, comes to others. And so that they too may pick up the mantle of this task and commission, and they too may participate in what we call the Great Commission. But here's the thing. If we limit the Great Commission just to Matthew's gospel, we really are doing a disservice. Because there really are great commissions that we find all throughout the rest of the New Testament, New Testament, and there's already forerunners in the Old Testament. We're not going to get into that today. You see, there's many places where we are called to speak, called to act, that we are to be proclaimers of the gospel and to partner in what Jesus is doing. And so the sermon series that we're going to be endeavoring to unpack is based on this work, The Great Commissions by Steve King, And so what we see is there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and the writings of Paul that all speak to some aspect of mission. So I want to liken it this way. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at this diamond. And we're going to be looking at these different angles about what is our role in God's redemptive mission in the world. The what, the where, the how, the who, the with, and the why. And when we look at God's mission that way and our role in it, we see that we are described in many different ways. Disciples were described as witnesses, proclaimers, missionaries, ambassadors, sent ones. So here's the bottom line. No matter what the image is or the description that we're given, it all falls back down to Jesus carrying on his mission in the world that he will complete, and for some reason he says to us, Come with me and partner with me. I want you to participate in this mission, but not just over there across an ocean, although that's part of it, but I want you to participate in this mission across your backyard fence, from your front porch, in your neighborhoods, within your homes, and in your community. Because guess what? The bottom line is God likes to work normally through the ordinary and the mundane. The stuff that we find boring, but that's the very place where the Spirit loves to do His work. One of the comforts I have from this text, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more, is that we do not do this mission alone. What did Jesus say at the end of that text that Lori read for us? I will be with you always. That is at the very heart of what gives us the strength and the power to live out our calling. It's a commission. It's a co-mission. Jesus is with us. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because I don't know about you, it kind of makes me a little nervous. Jesus says to us, I'm going to make you to be the vehicle and the means by which my very presence as the creator of the universe and the salvation that I have purchased and won through my life, death, and resurrection, you are going to be the vehicle by which that goes to somebody else. I'll speak for myself. That makes me a little nervous because I know myself all too well. 
we know ourselves all too well. But what does that promise mean for us? And we're going to put a pin in that for the moment and return to that. See, the Apostle Paul recognized our use as God's means. That the gospel comes to us, goes through us to others. And he, he, he draws this out in two places in this book, 2 Corinthians, chapter 2 and chapter 4. And I just briefly want us to look at these. He says this in chapter 2. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as people of sincerity commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So Paul's saying that we are commissioned. We are given a task to speak of Christ. And then later on in chapter 4, he says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. It's not about us. We have a problem with that as humans. It's not about us. But it's about Christ Jesus as Lord. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. If there's going to be a demonstration of power, it's going to be in our weakness so that God gets the credit for the strength. It's going to be in our shortcomings that God is going to work through so that he is glorified as his mission moves forward. Now, as I was studying and prepping for this, I, want, I referred back to that study, The Great Commissions, by Steve King, and he had a great short little paragraph about what this means for us as Christians, and this is what he wrote. He said, we are more than mere salesmen selling a religious product to potential consumers. Rather, we are the very instruments God uses to bring his saving gospel to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Whether it be across the globe or across our backyard fence, Jesus comes into the lives of others through us, creating faith in his promise and carrying out his ministry of reconciliation. So here's our big idea for today. That as disciples of Jesus, we are commissioned to make disciples with Jesus in everyday life. Okay, that's great, Pastor John. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is, this is what I want to start out with. So many times we'll look at this task at the end of Matthew's gospel and we'll be like, that's great for the Christians that received it on the mountain in Galilee. Or we'll say, that's great for those early Christians when Christianity was just starting up and they had to spread to the entire world. Or we'll say, that's great for the religious professionals and the clergy class. That's what we pay them to do. But here is the crux of the matter. Have you ever realized that when you create a bottleneck of a mission or a project going through a very narrow point, it usually just pools together and doesn't expand? You see, when Jesus gives this commission, of course he's giving it to the apostles who were the keepers of the faith but they were to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, and then we sit here today. See, the Great Commission is for all Christians. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter what your education level is. Doesn't matter what your past experience is. Doesn't matter what's coming down the pipe in the future. The Great Commission is for all of God's people. Disciples, which are students or apprentices of Jesus, learners or trainees of Jesus for the mission of God, those disciples are made by ordinary disciples in the ordinariness of life. But I have to tell you, it's not an impressive task. This isn't going to be something that looks sexy to everybody in the world. Oh, can I use that word in church? See, this is going to be in the very ordinariness, the mundane, the everyday, the changing of diapers. I'm speaking purely hypothetically. 
in the day-to-day -day task, in the day-to-day -day routines. That is where disciples are made as people are formed by the mission of God as we walk together with Jesus. And so let's take a look at the what of mission today, which comes from Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission of Christ in Matthew 28. I'm going to start with verse 18. And it's not that I'm skipping over 16 and 17, but I'm going to get back to that at the very end of the sermon, which is going to tie in. And when we start at verse 18, we see that Jesus came and told his disciples, this is after he's risen from the grave, this is as he's commissioning them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, if this is known as the Great Commission, what comes to mind when you think of the word commission? What do we think about? Well, think about this. In the military, if you are a commissioned officer... You have been given a task or duty, and there is authority that has put you there in that leadership position. If you're in government, there's a commission that's appointed charged with investigating or coming up with a solution to a problem. In the art world, an artist is someone who is what? Commissioned to create a painting or a sculpture. In all these types, being given a commission means you are charged with a duty or a task based on the power and authority and the resources of someone else. It's understood that as you carry out your job, your task, your commission, that you have the legitimacy to do that. And that you have the resources, whatever they may be, behind you in order to fulfill what your job is. We see that with the commissioned officer. We see that with the government commission. We see that with the patron or the benefactor with the art. And so as we look at the great commission that Jesus gives us, what is our task? To spread the gospel of Jesus, which is his life, death, and resurrection message, and to make disciples, which means followers of Jesus. And it is Christ himself, the one who sends us, who authorizes and empowers us to do this job. Now here's an insight from Steve King. I'm going to put one more quote up on there. He nails this as to what this means for us. This is what he says. Jesus is the one who holds the power to authorize the message spoken in his name. We do not determine the intent and content of the message with which we have been sent. We are merely the messengers or couriers who pass on his word. Here's a message for us as the church today in this congregation and all across this continent. We do not have the permission to change the message according to the whims and according to the culture of today. We are merely the couriers of an everlasting message that has power behind it because of the one who sends us. That is a huge responsibility. But what a privilege that is that God says, with your faults, with your shortcomings, you are my redeemed children. And I am going to give you this awesome task with me to have my reign of the kingdom go to the ends of the earth, beginning in your own home. Think about that. That is an awesome task. And then Jesus actually gives us the idea of how to go about the task when he goes on in verses 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. We literally saw part of the discipleship process a few minutes ago as we witnessed the baptism of Schuyler. As part of this making of disciples as part of the mission of God. Now, Pastor Tyler's going to be proud of me because I want you to geek out with me for two seconds. We're going to look at the Greek of 
this statement, because Pastor Tyler loves the biblical languages, and he is a way better scholar than I am. So I'm, I'm sweating bullets right now as, he, as he's going to help me out here. <laughs> if we look at this passage of, therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching, what do we think the primary job is? It looks like to go, right? But that's not the primary verb in the way that this is written. Here's how it reads. As you are going, disciple all nations by baptizing them and by teaching them. Going is not the primary verb. Discipling is to disciple, making disciples. As you are going, that sounds like the ebb and flow of life. That sounds awfully familiar if you're familiar with the Old Testament of when God gives us a command in Deuteronomy 6 that in your waking and in your sleeping and your eating and as you're sitting down and as you're rising up, you are saturating the life of your family with the word of God. And so what Jesus is drawing on here and as Matthew brings us about under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is this is part of the everyday living. This isn't relegated to just classes. This isn't relegated to just religious events. This is everyday living, the ebb and flow of normal life. A lot of times we can look at what making disciple is, making disciples is, and we can say, well, you know what? Isn't it really just about getting others to join our Christian club? Sometimes I see that in Christianity. How about this? Maybe we just need to get more names added to the membership list. Then we're really doing the Great Commission. How about this? We're going to focus on having a scholarly mastery of biblical content, and that will suffice as making disciples. Or... We just need to get everybody in the church involved in every single church program as much as possible. And then we're making disciples. No, I don't think that's that. Let's go back to what, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower, an apprentice, a learner. When you had rabbis in the first century... You would have disciples literally walking behind them, walking in the dust of the rabbi. You would have them imitating how the uh, rabbi would eat, how they would talk, how they would study, how they would do other things that are not appropriate to have in a congregational setting like this. Everything they did was imitating the rabbi, in the literal dust as they walked behind them. And so we see that this is more about life-on-life -life relationship and investment than merely a scholarly approach or participation in programs or anything like that. I had one mentor of mine say that disciples are trainees and interns for God's mission. And as I've thought about this for quite some time, I've come up with this definition for what a disciple of Jesus really is. It always starts with us receiving. So just as little Schuyler received the grace of God in this sacrament, just as we receive grace as the word is spoken and preached to us as we read God's word, being a disciple always begins with us receiving from God that we trust in the promises of Jesus in reception. Another thing is, is that we join and participate with him in his redemptive mission. Kind of like I talked about walking in the dust of the rabbi, we imitate Jesus. And we do this with others in our own life, but also as we see Jesus in the Gospels, and he disciples us that way as well. And then finally, we show others how to do the same. There is always a replication or a multiplication aspect of discipleship. God has come to me, blessed me, brought me from death to life, but that's not just for me. That's so I may be used by God as a tool or an instrument in his hands in the lives of somebody else. 
reception, imitation, and replication. And so we see these two big things that happen in Great Commission disciple-making. Being a disciple and making disciples is rooted in our identity in Jesus Christ. And baptism is central to our identity as a disciple, and it is a means of making disciples. Schuyler is a new creation in Christ Jesus. Not because of anything she has done, but because of the gracious will of God to claim her as a daughter of the kingdom. A new creation in Christ Jesus. And did you catch that at the very end of the baptism service? We welcome you into God's family, a fellow member of the body of Christ, and what? A fellow worker in the kingdom of God. The water's not even dry yet, and I'm sorry I put so much water on her head. The water's not even dry yet, and she is already being commissioned as a fellow worker with us in the kingdom of God. The gospel comes to us, works through us, and goes on to others as she is empowered to live a life in Christ Jesus. Our doing flows from our being. Our commission flows from our identity. And it's time and time again us going back to the source. It's the gospel. You cannot be a disciple and not return to the gospel. Or you may be a disciple of something else. See, the gospel is the fuel source. It is the power source of everything that we do as God's people. And that's why we need to return to it hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, all of our lives. But Jesus also tells us that this part of making disciples is by teaching. And so being a disciple is not an end in itself, but it's a means to God's mission. Now, we haven't busted out his name in quite some time, but here's a really succinct way of talking about discipleship. This is from Pastor Greg. Discipling is Jesus' process of showing the people of God how to participate in the mission of God as a daily lifestyle. I've heard it said by that author that this is what Jesus means. Come with me and let me give you on-the-job training so you gain experience, skill, and confidence in joining me on my Father's mission as a lifestyle. So there's not really a how-to per se of what disciple-making looks like, but I will say this. To join in the mission of God is to seek the kingdom. Seeking the kingdom means looking where God is at work. Where does it look like God's at work? It's probably some type of pain in the world. Some type of thing that has to deal with relationship. Has to deal with where we get the pushing, the nudge of the Holy Spirit to sit and listen when somebody needs to be listened to and not given words. To speak a timely word when the Holy Spirit nudges us to do so. To figuratively or literally give a cup of cool water when someone is in need of that. It's the small things where the Spirit is at work. Now here's the thing. As Pastor Tyler spoke about in Confession, we see those opportunities all the time, and we miss them all the time. But here's the good news. God is not like, oh my gosh, Jonathan missed the opportunity. The mission of God is done. No. Because what he's saying is, okay, next time keep your eye open. The mission is still going to go on. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me. Look for, your, look for the fields are ripe for harvest. There's opportunities all about us. Not to seal the deal and do a baptism on the spot, which sometimes that does happen, but to scatter the seeds of what the Spirit wants out there and to let him bring the growth. Sometimes we may be the one that scatters the seed. Other times we may be the one that waters. Other times we may be the one who brings in the harvest. But guess what? That's not up to us. That's up to the Spirit's work as he works in us and through us and sometimes in spite of us. So the bottom line of being a disciple and making disciples 
is to keep in mind that we are grateful beneficiaries, that we receive first and foremost, and that we are commissioned as active agents of that same grace of God as he presents these opportunities all around us in our home, our workplace, our schools, our neighborhoods, and our communities. And then we get to this last part. This last part. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I think a lot of times this part can often get overlooked or minimalized because you're like, yes, Jesus has all the authority in heaven and on earth. Go, Jesus. And then we get the way of how discipleship goes with baptizing and teaching. And then this is kind of like, okay, we're going to slap this on the end as the caboose and we'll call it good. But I think there's something here. Why does Jesus say that he will be with us always? Remember I said before that I didn't touch on verse 16 and 17. Well, in those verses we see that the disciples came and worshipped Jesus, but it says this, and some of them doubted. And we can get on the disciples and say, how could you doubt You're standing there with the risen Jesus. But if we put ourselves in their shoes, I have a feeling we'd have some questions too. And a lot of the times we'll look at this and say, you saw Jesus dead, you saw him alive, how could you doubt? But I think there's something else going on here. Remember that Jesus had been walking with these guys for three years. And what is he doing? He is modeling how to disciple others as he disciples them. So I think part of the doubt that they're experiencing is saying, Jesus, I don't know if we can do this. It was all well and good when you discipled us, but I don't know if we can disciple other people. I don't know if we can carry on the mission. I don't know if we have what it takes to carry out your commission. And after telling them how to make disciples, he gives them this, which is something that should not cause anxiety, but is a promise. You ever notice when you read a book of the Bible, it's really important to look at the whole book and not just a portion of it? This phrase is in Matthew's gospel. And if you look at all of Matthew's gospel, you'll find something pretty cool. If you go all the way back to the beginning of Matthew's gospel, of course we have the genealogy, which everybody loves to read through and study. But after that, you have what? The Christmas story. And it's there that you see that Joseph is deliberating whether he's supposed to quietly dismiss Mary because this doesn't look good for him, but there's an angel that comes to him in a dream. And the angel says, take Mary as your wife, do not be afraid. And that the child's name is going to be Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. But did you notice there's another name that he is given in this message from the angel? Emmanuel, God with us. And I find that interesting that here you have a bookend at the beginning of Matthew's gospel about God being with us, and at the very end with the Great Commission, I will be with you always. And when you put those together, what you see is a message that from start to finish, Jesus is going to be the ever-faithful and ever-present God from beginning until the end. That is the joy-filled promise that God gives us in his son as we look at this great commission. That he dwells with us, he delivers us, and he deploys us as the ever-present and ever-faithful God. I want to wrap up our message today. And I want to bring up this specific point because I want us to keep this front and center as we look at all of these aspects of the great commission. It's that we have to start thinking about task and person. And there's an instructor back in Buffalo. His name is Dion Drake. 
that time and again he would bring this up as we talk about mission. He would bring it up in his preaching. He would bring this up in his teaching. And this is the quote that he brought up. Before you and I are called to a task, we are called to a person, Jesus Christ. And so my prayer for this series is that, yes, as we talk about the various parts of mission and aspects of mission and how we're involved, that we never move from the clear sight that we are called to a person, Jesus, and is because of only being called to him that we have this task of carrying out the Great Commission as part of the mission of God. Because whether we're talking about our faith life, whether we're talking about the Great Commission, whether we're talking about anything from beginning to end, from start to finish, it is all about Jesus. And that's where we're going to leave it until next week. So here's your reflection questions for this week. First question is this. What comfort do you receive in knowing that you are empowered with Jesus' presence and that you are sent with Jesus' authority as you participate in God's mission? What comfort do you receive knowing that? The second thing is, what is revealed about God in that he purposefully chooses to partner with his people in order to carry out his redemptive mission in our world. In other words, what does that say about God that he purposefully wants to use us as redeemed people as his means? And then the last group is, what are some of your preconceived notions about discipleship? And what is the next step that you can take to grow as a disciple and to participate in God's mission? So next week, we're going to be looking at the gospel of Mark, the where of mission, and how our mission is to the world. So let us pray. 